We're going to begin here. Uh, thank you all uh, very much for coming tonight. It's, uh, this is uh, overwhelming, actually, the turnout here. It's uh, very, uh, very exciting to see so many people come out on a, on a Wednesday night, nonetheless, even when the Chiefs are playing next door, it looks like. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Jason Lum. I'm the uh, acting mayor. Uh, on, I'm here on behalf of mayor and council. Mayor Gates is, uh, is taking a well-deserved holiday right now. Otherwise, I know she'd love to be here. I just want to quickly recognize the councillors in the room. Uh, we've got Councillor Ken Popov, Councillor Chris Clute, Councillor Sam Waddington, and I'm not sure if I saw Councillor Chuck Stam come sneaking in or Councillor Attrell. I think uh, both of them uh, will be coming tonight as well. Uh, it goes to show you how much uh, Council believes in uh, the presentation you're about to see. We had uh, the privilege of meeting Jim this afternoon and talking to him. And uh, tonight it's really all about uh, you guys, the community, and mobilizing neighbour power. So I'm going to take a quick second to introduce to you tonight the speaker. Uh, Jim Dyers is all about building community. Jim has a passion for getting people engaged. Uh, with their communities and in the decisions that affect their lives. Since moving to Seattle in 1976, he's put that passion to work for a direct action neighborhood association, a community development corporation, a community foundation, and the nation's largest healthcare cooperative. He was appointed the first director of Seattle's Department of Neighborhoods in 1988, where he served under three mayors over the next 14 years. Currently, Jim teaches courses in the community organizing and development at the University of Washington, and he serves on the faculty of the Asset-Based Community Development Institute. He travels internationally to deliver speeches, present workshops, and provide technical assistance to community associations, nonprofit organizations, and government. Jim received a BA and an honorary doctorate from Grinnell College. His work in the Department of Neighborhoods was recognized with an Innovations Award from the Kennedy School of Government, a full inclusion award from the American Association on Developmental Disabilities, and the Public Employee of the Year Award from the Municipal League of King County. Jim's book, Neighbor Power, Building Community, the Seattle Way, is available in both English and Chinese editions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jim Dyers. Thanks, Council Member. Thanks, it's great to be in Chilliwack. Yeah, I was born in Burnaby. Uh, and uh, as, at a young age, my dad's best friend was in Chilliwack, so we used to come here all the time. Uh, then we moved to the States. Uh, but it's great to be back. After I uh, gave my talk today, I went over to Bridal Vale Falls. I went down to the wetlands, just had the best time. I'm staying at the Royal Hotel, fantastic. I was there eating, and I heard this piano playing. I walked outside, there's a guy playing the piano right on the street. I love this place, it's great. Great to be here. So uh, I'm somebody who's absolutely passionate about community. Um, I'm somebody who really believes in the importance of government and government doing right by communities and working as a partner with communities. But I've come to believe over, believe over time that there's absolutely no substitute for the community itself when it comes to the things we care most deeply about. So I want to talk a little bit about the power of community. And I'm going to share stories from all over the world. I'm working in 17 different countries. But most of my experience has been in Seattle. Uh, and a lot of the programs, uh, stories I'm going to share from a program we developed called the Neighborhood Matching Fund, where we provide a cash match from local government in exchange for the community's equal match of volunteer labor in support of neighbor-initiated projects. So through that program, more than 5,000 projects have been completed over the past 25 years. Don't worry, I'm not going to share all, all 5,000. Uh, but I want to share a few. And what I talk about, you know, Seattle's a little larger than, than Chilliwack. We have about 650,000 people in our city. Uh, but the scale at which I'm going to talk is at our neighborhood level. And our neighborhoods are more like 5,000 people or 10,000, 5 to 10,000. So when I, when I talk, I hopefully you can relate to these stories. It's not about Seattle as a whole. It's really about place. It's about uh, very local places. So the first uh, real power I think communities have is the power to care for the earth. I'm particularly concerned about this with climate change. And I'm convinced we aren't going to make it if it's just about green technology. We actually have to change the way we live. And I think that will only happen if we feel some sense of connection with each other and the place where, that we share. 
in some sense that collectively our actions will make a difference. So I want to share a story from one neighborhood, the Ballard neighborhood of Seattle, near North End neighborhood of Seattle. And Ballard was the neighborhood of Seattle that had the least number of street trees of any neighborhood in Seattle. This was 25 years ago. They also had the least number of parks of any neighborhood outside of downtown Seattle. And there was one woman there named Dravilla Gowan who cared passionately about trees. She wanted to see trees up and down the streets. So she put notices in her church bulletin. She put a notice in the Ballard News Tribune, the local paper. And she uh, put a notice in the corner grocery store, advertising for other people who shared her passion for street trees. And Dravilla tried to find somebody in every block in Ballard who shared her passion. And if nobody came forward, she'd go to that block and knock on every door until she convinced somebody they shared her passion for street trees. <laughs> and then she got that person to sign a pledge form saying, I'll come to a training about how to plant and take care of the trees. I'll recruit my neighbors to do the same thing. She turned in all of her pledge forms with her matching fund application. And one day, trucks pulled into her neighborhood with 1,080 trees. They dropped them off at every block in Ballard. Dervilla knocked on the door of the block captain and said, the trees are here. Block captain knocked on the neighbor's doors. That day, over 1,000 people came out of their homes and planted trees up and down the streets. People felt incredibly empowered. Beginning of the day, there were no street trees. The end of the day, they had tree-lined streets. Look what we can do when we work together as a community. They said, we still have the least number of parks of any neighborhood in Seattle. So they walked around the neighborhood looking for potential park sites. Hard, had a hard time finding them because the neighborhood is pretty developed. But they finally found this old rundown house that used to serve as a nursery. The house was falling down. The property was overgrown. It was a huge public safety problem. It was right next to our business district. The community convinced the city to buy that property for a park. The city had some open space bond money to buy the property, but absolutely no money to design or build the park. So the neighbors did it themselves. Local landscape architect volunteered her services and worked with the other neighbors, and together they designed and built Baker Park, all with volunteers. This is entranceway into the park. This is some of the landscaping. There were some beautiful old trees in this park because it used to be a nursery, and one of them had died. They're trying to figure out how to remove it, and then one of the neighbors who was Native American had a better idea, and he carved it in place as a totem. And here's some of the detail. This group went on the next year, and they tore up all the asphalt around the local school. They called it a Greater Green Project. Much better for the environment, because the water can percolate through the soil rather than having instant runoff. Much better for the kids and for the neighbors, because now they have a green place to play. Now we do it at all our schools, but it's the kind of innovation that comes out of community. This is the opening day when they had their dedication, and the local band performed. Uh, it's a sedentary Sousa band, a marching band that only plays while sitting down. <laughs> This is another piece of property in the community. Um, this was platted as a street. There are houses on either side, but it was never developed because it's too steep. Cars could never make it to the top. This is one of the Seattle's famous hills. As a result, the property was no good for transportation. It was owned by a transportation department, so it just became overgrown. It became a huge problem in the neighborhood. It, became over, uh, it was attracting rodents. The only thing that tried to get up were four-wheel drive vehicles. They come in the middle of the night, they'd race their engines, you know, squeal their tires, challenging each other to make it to the top, driving the neighbors totally crazy. I thought the neighbors were nuts because they went out with picks and shovels, dug through that heavy hard pan clay soil by hand, hauled those timbers up the side, terrace that whole problem hillside and turned that problem property into a community garden. This is now one of 95 organic community gardens we have in the city of Seattle, all built by the neighbors. We have 7,000 urban gardeners and collectively they donate 15 tons of organic produce to our food banks every year. That's the power of community. This is the group's most recent project. This is the site of another former house. So to commemorate the house, they built all the furniture out of cement. And at the dedication of this uh, park, they unveiled a timeline that shows the 20 parks they built over the past 20 years, every one of them with volunteers. They've uh, renaturalized natural areas. They worked with the kids to build a skate park. They built a playground. They built ball fields. They're restoring a salmon estuary. 20 parks in 20 years, all volunteer, one neighborhood. They said, this is great. We've made our neighborhood a much better place, but we're concerned about what's happening to the planet. We're concerned about climate change. So they organized an all-volunteer group called Sustainable Ballard. 
And every summer for the past 12 years, they've had a sustainable Ballard Fest. And in the local park, they have music and food to bring people in. Then they have booths to educate neighbors about what they can do to reduce their carbon footprint. And the first booth you go to is the end driver's license station where you go and check all the ways you will not drive over the next month. And when you do, you get a laminated on driver's license. It's kind of cool. It's just like my official Washington State driver's license. So this is Julia Fields' project. This is her license. She says, I'm going to walk. I'm going to bike. and take transit. I'm going to take the train. When you get your on driver's license, it entitles you to drive the shuffle bus. <laughs> this is like a Fred Flintstone mobile. It's pedaled by feet. It's going down the streets, gets everybody's attention, gets people thinking, what can I do to get out of my car? What can I do to reduce my carbon footprint? This has created a movement now. All the neighborhoods around Ballard have organized their own all-volunteer sustainability groups. All the suburban communities around Seattle have done the same. We now have 67 of these all-volunteer organizations, and collectively they call themselves Scallops, Sustainable Communities All Over Puget Sound. And it all started with their Villa Gowan and those street trees 25 years ago. There is incredible untapped power in our communities. Doesn't happen overnight, but it builds. And I really think it's the only way we're going to deal with climate change. Second unique power of communities is power to care for one another. Agencies of all kinds can provide services, but only communities can provide care 24-7. This is a story I was just uh, in uh, New Zealand last week uh, with my students. I had 22 University of Washington students there. Uh, and we visited this school near Wellington in um, New Zealand. And it's a very low-income neighborhood, a puny school in the lower hut. Um, but they started up a project they called Common Unity, Community. And they tore up an uh, old soccer field that wasn't being utilized anymore. And the kids built an urban farm. Here they are building it. They created the fence themselves. And they grow organic produce. They have a food forest. This is uh, 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 the greenhouse, all made out of uh, the, the covers for uh, slot machines. <laughs> Recycling. Um, they're capturing the water off the roof, and all the water is, is recycled water. They've got bees, and they're, they're making things out of beeswax and honey. They've got uh, um, uh, worm bins. <laughs> this is great. They built a little hobbit house, only in New Zealand. <laughs> and inside, they've got little furniture, and they've got a library in there. The kids just love to go in there and read. All built by the community, all built out of recycled materials. And here the kids are harvesting their vegetables. And they prepare their vegetables in the school cafeteria. That's what they eat for lunch. Low-income school, they're eating organic vegetables. And it only costs them $10 a day to feed all 100 students in the school because all the food comes out of their garden. And the parents and other community members work with them to help prepare the meals. And then the, the families who don't have enough food can take the excess back to their homes to eat. But they realized they had a portable there. And there were women in the, uh, in the community who wanted to start up some jobs. And they had sewing skills. So they taught each other how to sew. And now they're making all kinds of things, uh, sewing products and selling them and making income. When my students were there, they really got excited about the handbags. And they bought a bunch of those. There was another uh, group that started up around knitting. Uh, in New Zealand, only about 5% of the homes are insulated. So there's a huge issue with rheumatic fever, with uh, 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 illness around cold. So uh, the kids are knitting, and they're knitting blankets. And they told me stories about kids who knitted a spent a whole year knitting a blanket only to give it away to somebody who needed it more than them. My students got so excited, a couple of them knew how to knit, so they started knitting. And they taught all the other students how to knit. And by the end, every one of us was knitting. We made a couple blankets. <laughs> This woman uh, was a, a victim of domestic violence. Uh, as a result, she had huge issues around drugs and alcoholism, but she was passionate about bicycles and knew how to repair bicycles. So she started up a bicycle repair at the school, and she's fixing kids' bicycles and fixing bicycles that haven't worked anymore and you know, that people want to donate so that every kid at the school gets a bike, but they earn their bicycle by making the blankets, by working in the garden. 
very little money uh, changes hands. People support each other just by, uh, through the services they provi provide to one another. Uh, they built this BMX track. This is a really cool project. They raise sun the kids raise sunflowers. And then they uh, uh, gather up the sunflower heads and gather the seeds. And then the kids make seed packets. Fill them up and they send them to schools all over New Zealand. And now sunflowers are in every school in New Zealand. And these kids are tracking it on a map. And here's a very low income school that is greatly contributing to the, all the people of New Zealand. And I love this sign they have in the garden. It kind of, uh, su kind of summarizes what they're all about. We have two hands, one for giving and one for receiving. But I think too often we're just focused about how do we be good volunteers. And I'm kind of passionate about I think we sort of need fewer volunteers and we need more citizens. And I think volunteers are people who are always giving to people they see as needy. But they do it kind of in their spare time. They do it, you know, in a, it's sort of an exception to what they usually do. And being a citizen is just recognizing we all have gifts and we all have needs. It's about how do we support each other. It's how do we live. It's not how do, what do we do on the side. It's how do we carry out our lives. <clears throat> Another unique power of communities is the power to prevent crime. Again, there's a role for, for, for professionals. You don't want communities enforcing the laws or making up their own laws. You want this uh, council to do that, and you want the police to enforce it. But when it comes to preventing crime, there's no substitute for community. Police officers can't prevent crime. Communities do. We spent too, way too many resources lining up the ambulances at the bottom of the cliff when community's job is to build the fence at the top. In my country, we spent more and more money in so-called public safety programs, and we have more and more and more people behind bars and nobody's feeling any more safe. We've forgotten about the role of community. Drives me crazy when people are complaining to government about the youth problem. Whose youth are they? <laughs> right? And who's in a better position to raise them than the community? We've sort of forgotten about the role of community. I think some of it's because you, have, you tend to have better government than we have in the states, you know? You sort of think, well, government's job is to take care of us, and our job is to pay the taxes. But government can't build community for us. Government can't raise our kids for us. So this is in the Soto neighborhood of Seattle. This is a warehouse in industrial area just south of downtown Seattle. I wish I had the before picture because the backs of the warehouses were covered with graffiti. There was garbage all along the tracks. And it's the first view that commuters and tourists get of Seattle each day because it's how our light rail comes in. It looked terrible. Mike Perringer here worked in the local factory. He was embarrassed about this image of his neighborhood. He had a great idea. He says, why don't we see the backs of the warehouses potential canvases for murals? Call it the Urban Art Quarter. But Mike had an even better idea, and he worked with our court system, and he asked the judges, could you offer the kids who get busted for graffiti an alternative sentence where they could come and help us to create the murals? Not an easy decision for the kids, because it's like a job. You had to show up at work on time. You had to dress appropriately. You got life skills training, mentored by professional artists. But young people create every one of these murals. And we found that as long as the kids were involved in the program, not one of them reoffended. The problem in Seattle is you can only paint outdoor murals three months a year because it's raining the other nine months. <laughs> so Mike came up with another great idea, got a local warehouse to donate their space, and in there they create murals on uh, four by eight sheets of plywood. They put those around construction sites. The developers pay for the murals, and it keeps the program sustainable over time. So now more than 1,500 murals have been created through the program, and more than 5,000 young people have participated. And you don't have to get busted in order to get into the program. We didn't want to create negative incentives, right? <laughs> Another unique power of communities, the power to sustain the local economy. This is from Edmonton, 118th Avenue. Uh, that's the area in between the two stadiums. A uh, really rough area. It's where the business district was. Um, uh, uh, there were lots of prostitutes, drug dealing, uh, a lot of crime happening there. So a lot of the businesses, had, most of the businesses had closed. A lot of police action on that street. The city's response was, we're going to put in a new streetscape to, get, to make this an exciting place. So because it was between the two stadiums, they did it with the sports theme. And they had hockey players hanging from the... Uh, uh, the light poles. Uh, they had a bat that was sort of the uh, gateway into the neighborhood. Uh, but the problems with prostitution continued. So some of the artists in the neighborhood simply fabricated a gigantic condom and put it on top of the bat. Yeah. <clears throat> 
But they realized things weren't going to change unless the community took some action. So the community came together and said, we've got a lot of artists in our community. They had a vacant lot there, and they started up a community, uh, an art fair on that vacant lot. It was so successful, they said, let's figure out how we can keep this going on a regular basis. Came up with a great idea and took over a, a boarded up building and turned it and renovated it to become the Carrot, which is a community coffee house. And it's all staffed by neighbors, volunteers who are uh, 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 making the coffee, and as people gather in the coffee shop, they come up with ideas about how to make the neighborhood a better place. And there's always mu musicians performing there. This is one of the turnouts that quickly outgrew that space. And they said, you know, that festival we had, that was pretty successful on that vacant lot. Let's take over 118th. So they put together a huge festival called Kaleido, and they've been doing it every summer. And it's, people come from all over Alberta. It's so exciting. Here's some of the uh, different acts they have there. They've got belly dancers, all kinds of paintings, uh, people walking up the sides of buildings. <laughs> and they just use the businesses as a venue. So here are, here's a choir performing from the rooftop. Burn barrels, showing movies. And, and then it started bringing businesses back into 118th. One of them was a snowboard business. So they said, let's have a winter festival. So they organized a deep freeze festival, which is also incredibly successful. And so they have hockey right there in the middle of the street. They uh, put in a, a hill for uh, snowboarding and for sledding. They have deep freeze boxes, uh, races. <laughs> Lots of snow sculpture. Ice sculpture, just an amazing event. And now all kinds of new businesses have come on to 118th. This is one of the more recent ones, fantastic facility, and it was generated through the community. It's upstairs, it's all cooperative housing for artists. Because oftentimes it's artists who make our neighborhoods better places, but they're often, when our neighborhoods become better places, they're often the first people have to leave because they can no longer afford the prices. So they wanted to make it permanently affordable. And downstairs, they have uh, art studios and galleries for people with disabilities who want to be involved in the art. So it's a fantastic facility. And the uh, artists are actually selling uh, their works in the gallery. And now we believe in 118th. Another unique power of community, I think, is the power to promote health. There are studies that show that only about 15% of health outcomes can actually be attributed to healthcare professionals. That in many ways, our communities can have a much bigger impact on our health, on the behaviors that influence our health, on our mental health, and on the social determinants of health. You know, the economic conditions we face, the physical conditions, the environmental conditions that impact our health. So this is in Lewisham, in South London, in England. The guy on the right-hand side is a physician. And he realized that a high percentage of his patients, their primary complaint was that they were lonely. They were depressed. So he organized a time bank. Do you know about time banks? You might know it by a different name. But it's when people join. It's a huge movement now around the world. But people join a, a network and say, hey, I'm going to give an hour of my skill to somebody else in the network who needs it. And for every hour you provide, you get an hour of a skill that you need from somebody else in the network. And what I love about it, it's, it's everybody's time is valued exactly the same. So the lawyers is the same as the child care worker, is the same as the electrician, is the same as the plumber, is the same as the uh, gardener. Everybody's treated the same. And it's a great way for people on the margins of the economy to get their basic needs met. But it's also a great way to connect people who are often disconnected in our society, you know, across age, across uh, abilities. A uh, fantastic way to build community. So anyhow, he started up a time bank. And rather than prescribe pills, he prescribed that his patients join the time bank. And he took me to a bring and fix event just to illustrate all the things you can get fixed by your neighbors. And if you pledge two hours of your time, you've got to go to this event, bring something that was broken, and get it fixed. So uh, here's an illustration of all the things you could get fixed just by your neighbors. This one is fixing people's clothes. This guy's fixing small appliances, like a blender. Kids are fixing people's bicycles. Fixing somebody's hair. <laughs> fixing somebody's back. <laughs> She's pretty happy because she got her high heel fixed. But what I love about time banks, it's a way to do things together through mutual support. So here people are working together to make a fruit smoothie. Yeah. <laughs> and this woman offers skydiving lessons. <laughs> so you can get just about anything you want through the time bank. 
And here they are celebrating the eighth birthday of the Italian Bank. It's a huge, powerful movement that's happening all over the world. Another unique power of community is the power to recover from disaster. Both Kobe and Christchurch, the sister cities of Seattle, I was in both places before the earthquakes, I was there after the earthquake. They said the number one lesson they learned, yes, it's important to have the emergency supplies, but there's nothing more important than knowing your neighbors. Because often that's all you can count on right after an emergency. They certainly found that in Christchurch. I was just in uh, Lexington, Kentucky for my nephew's wedding. I was walking down the street. I saw this house with this plaque. I said, man, that's kind of weird. It says this house built with the support of loving neighbors and friends. So I knocked on the door, said, what's the, what's, what, you know, what's the story? And this woman named John answered the door. She said she'd been in Louisville that, uh, one night, and in the middle of the night, two in the morning, she got a call from her neighbor saying, John, your house has been struck by lightning, and it's on fire. She raced back to Lexington, and by the time she got back, her house was a total ruins. But her neighbors had already gone in and rescued what they could from the house. And they found her a place to stay in the neighborhood. The neighbor kids, without anybody suggesting it, went out and organized a lemonade stand to raise money to help her rebuild that house. <laughs> of course, it didn't make a huge difference in her budget, but it made a gigantic difference in her morale. And she said it really is what got her through that crisis. So she rebuilt the house in the style, the Victorian style that all the neighbors loved. And she has the picture on the, on the refrigerator that the kids drew of her old house. Speaking of Christ Church, this is uh, the namesake Christ Church Cathedral. It's probably going to be torn down. 80% of the downtown was lost. Half of many of the neighborhoods were lost. Vacant lots everywhere. But the community came together and said, we've got to create gathering places where we can come together and support each other, help us get through this crisis. They'd lost a lot of their gathering places. So a uh, major, uh, major hotel downtown collapsed, and they said, we want to create a gathering place here. All they had were a bunch of construction pallets. So they built the Blue Pallet Pavilion, all built by neighbors. And that was their opening day. Look at the greenery in there, just beautiful. And they have a performance stage. And every time I go, there's something going on. There's a poetry slam, there's a rock concert. All kinds of events happen there. It's just a great gathering place. And the last time I was there, they're celebrating the uh, Holy Day, the uh, Indian Festival of Color, and throwing that colored flower at each other. And it was just a riot. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another vacant lot. Somebody had an old washing machine, and they uh, put speakers on the inside of the washing machine. And if you hook up your iPod and put in a couple quarters, you can play whatever dance music you want. <laughs> and, and they have a dance floor. And there, in the middle of all this devastation, people are dancing. They had another vacant lot. They have so many vacant lots. But they had another one where they whitewashed the wall. And people could, uh, and, and there they, uh, they show movies. And you ride up in your bicycle, and you hook it up to a generator, and as long as you're biking, the movie plays. <laughs> it's psycho power cinema. It's fantastic. You get exercise, you're working, you're with your neighbors, and you get to watch a great movie. The kind of creativity that only comes out of community, I think. Another vacant lot where they whitewashed the wall and they put up a, uh, so people could write poetry on this wall. And they do poetry readings here. And this poem in particular really got to me. Amidst the shards of glass and twisted steel, beside the fallen brick and scattered concrete, we began to understand that there is beauty in the broken. Strangers do not live here anymore. And how through that disaster, people came to understand what was most important in their lives, which is each other. Prior to that earthquake, Christchurch had been known as probably the most class-conscious city in New Zealand. The first question was often, where'd you go to school? Now the first question is, you OK? How you doing? It's a really important lesson they learned, but it's one we often learn when it's too late. And I think because of many of the crises we're facing in our society now with climate change, with the economic crisis, the democratic crisis, where people are thinking of themselves as ratepayers rather than as citizens, we're starting to wake up and realize we need to bring back community. 
It was great chasing the material things, but that's not where the real happiness is. The happiness is in connecting with each other. And there was just a study done in the Lower Mainland by the uh, Vancouver Foundation that shows the incredible breakdown of community in the Lower Mainland of BC. And a lot of it's because we've all been organized into silos. We've got our senior center and senior programs over here. We've got our youth programs over here. We've got services for people with disabilities over here and special facilities for them. And we've got special programs for new immigrants and refugees. We're taking such great care of everybody through our agencies, but we've lost our community. You can't build community in silos. Oh, God, I've depressed everybody. OK. <laughs> So I'm actually really hopeful. I just I see incredible change happening now all over the world. And a lot of it's because of these crises. I, I mentioned this earlier, that I was in Taiwan and was reminded that Chinese character for crisis is, made, uh, is really two characters, one meaning danger and the other meaning opportunity. So with every crisis, we have both danger and opportunity. The good news is right now we got lots of opportunity. <laughs> lots of opportunity for change. So I see change happening everywhere. I think that the, what I really want to focus on now is how do we get, I mean, this is absolutely incredible how many people are here. I'm blown away. This is great. This is, yeah, give yourselves a hand. No, really, I mean, wow. <laughs> but you're still a pretty small fraction. And you're probably the people who are already doing this stuff, right? So uh, the, the key is uh, community can't just be done by a few people. Community re really requires everybody. That's what the community is. So I want to share some of the lessons I've learned about how to get more people engaged. You up for that? It's not rocket science. It's really simple ideas, but I think we've often forgotten them. So I just want to share some tips for how do we get more people engaged in our community. And then we'll open it up for some questions. Does that sound good? Good. So um, I, I mentioned this uh, today when we met with council, but uh, how many of you know Robert Putnam's work? Professor at Harvard University wrote the most depressing book for those of us who care about community because he tracks the incredible breakdown of community life in North America over the past 50 years. And he says one of the key, the key things breaking down community is television. He cites lots of reasons, you know, single purpose land use, increasing mobility, fear, globalization, all kinds of issues. But he says the key thing is television. He wrote this book about 15, 20 years ago, so now I think he would add video games and Facebook and all those other electronic screens. So I keep, I've been stuck in hotel rooms for the last few nights. I've watched a little bit of television. I thought, oh my god, if this is our competition, <laughs> and we're losing? <laughs> Come on, it shouldn't be that hard to compete with television, to make it more interesting, to make it more satisfying than television. It shouldn't be that hard. And I think the problem in our community work too often is that we have forgotten how to have fun. We've made community work drudgery. We've made it like our cross to bear. And if we look like we aren't having fun, why is anybody going to want to follow us? Right? I got a friend who says, Jim, the problem getting people involved in community is those GD activists. I said, GD? What are you talking about? The grim and determined. <laughs> And it cracked me up, because it describes so many of the self-proclaimed community leaders I know in Seattle who are always negative. They just like to sit around and complain all the time, right? And some people gravitate to the negativity, but most people get involved because they have a sense of hope. It's like, why would you get involved if you don't think you can make change, right? So in many ways, those GD activists became the, become the gatekeepers and keep everybody else away. I got another friend who says, why have a meeting when you can have a party. <laughs> Think about it. The purpose isn't who can endure the most suffering. <laughs> the purpose is to build relationships. And can't you build relationships a lot more through fun than you can through meetings? So why do we always resort to meetings as a way to try to bring people together? It's really dumb. So I want to share a couple stories about communities that have learned how to have fun. First one's in our Fremont neighborhood, near the north end of Seattle close to Fremont, Fremont, or close to Ballard, Fremont has lots of artists, and I find artists know how to have fun. So they've created all kinds of public art. Here's one of the first ones they built, which is uh, uh, Waiting for the Inner Urban, a statue where people have been waiting for the bus for so long, they've turned to stone. <laughs> 
They have a, uh, 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 drawbridge coming into Fremont, and there in the tower of the drawbridge, they have Rapunzel with her hair coming down, her neon lights. There was a lot of controversy with, uh, with our city hall in the late 1980s, which really gave rise to the Department of Neighborhoods. And a lot of it was around the growth pressures in Seattle, the changing character of our neighborhoods, and increasing issues with traffic and parking and gangs and drugs, and people feeling like government wasn't being responsive. So people all over were signing petitions. They were coming to city council meetings and testifying. Fremont, they were really angry, but they simply erected a rocket on the side of a business and announced that it was aimed at City Hall. <laughs> they declared themselves the Artist Republic of Fremont. They started issuing their own postage stamps. They probably had more fun than any other neighborhood and were probably the best heard, right? Because they did something a little unusual. They had fun. They got a lot of people engaged. This is a... Uh, um, an old power station at the elementary school that wasn't being utilized anymore in Fremont. So they used our matching funds to renovate it as a place where artists could work with other community members to make fantastic um, floats and costumes for their annual solstice parade. Fantastic parade. They don't allow any uh, commercial advertising, no motorized vehicles, just fantastic costumes and floats made by the neighbors. So here's some examples. This is just one neighborhood. Yeah, every one of these is handmade by neighbors. Just fantastic costumes. But the parade is led by dozens and dozens of uh, bicyclists wearing absolutely no costumes at all. <laughs> dozens of naked bicyclists. We'll go through these kind of fast. <laughs> Most people are having fun. Yeah. <laughs> This is a, um, a bridge, another bridge in Fremont, and underneath the bridge was good for nothing except holding it up. So there are lots of problems underneath with illegal dumping, with drug use, all kinds of issues. You know, any other neighborhood, I think they would have put a fence around to keep out the problems. In Fremont, they had these artists, they had a different idea. They said, this is kind of cool space. We've got an idea, we're going to bring in a troll. <laughs> and they built a gigantic troll under the bridge. And now this troll brings people from absolutely all over the world. Oh, no, oh, I missed my slides. So that now in Fremont, they, they do Shakespeare on the troll. At Halloween, they celebrate Trollween in Fremont. And thousands of people come and they howl at the troll and do processions through the streets of Fremont. At Christmas time, all the Santa Clauses gather there. They just celebrate the 20th birthday of the troll. And now this troll brings people from all over the world. And when they come, they shop in the local business district, totally revitalizing the business district. And there's never any public safety problems under the bridge because there's always legitimate activity underneath the bridge. Not a solution that would have come out of our police department, right? Huge public safety problem under the bridge. Let's bring in a troll. I don't think so. The creativity out of the community is just amazing. <clears throat> well, they said, this is great. We've made our neighborhood a much better place. We need more public art. And they were looking around for more sculptures they could have in the neighborhood. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they got a really good deal on Lenin. <laughs> and the Chamber of Commerce brought Lenin to the town square, where he presides over Taco Del Mar. <laughs> and they have a lot of fun with Lenin. Here he is in the, uh, in the solstice parade. And sometimes they dress him up. They give him shades and a guitar. And he's John Lennon. Imagine. <laughs> And when they have the gay pride parade, he's always dressed in drag. <laughs> and at Christmas time, they have the annual wedding of Lennon. <laughs> so they have fun in Fremont. And really, it gets everybody engaged. People just love that neighborhood. They, you know, there's a role for everybody. But you know, it, uh, it may not be appropriate in your neighborhood. I don't know, to have naked bicyclists in Lennon? I don't know. Uh, but I think every community knows how to have fun. So I want to share a story about a very different neighborhood that learned how to have fun. This is in Elgin, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. I was doing a workshop there, and I, I took a tour around the neighborhood, and I saw this gigantic blue wooden tulip in front of somebody's house. I said, what's the story? That is really weird. They told me a story. They said, there's this guy who collects junk. He can't help himself. He collects more and more and more junk. His wife gets on his case and makes him take the junk back to the dump. But every time he returns, he's got more junk than what he left. Some of you know this guy. Right? <laughs> he went one time and he found this gigantic blue wooden tulip in the dump. He says, man, that is too good to let go to waste. 
So he brought it back home. He planted it in his front yard, told all the neighbors, come over Friday night. I'm having a blue tulip party. All the neighbors are scratching their heads. Nobody ever heard of a blue tulip party before, but they were curious, so they came over. They had the best time. There was barbecue. The kids had formed a band. People were dancing. They met all their neighbors. They had so much fun that the next Friday night, that blue tulip showed up in front of somebody else's house. <laughs> and that blue tulip now has been traveling around the city of Elgin for 15 years, every Friday night in front of somebody else's house. And all week long, the neighbors are walking around the neighborhood trying to figure out, where's that blue tulip going to be this week? It's connecting neighbors in a way nothing else could have because it's fun. It's engaging. So if we want to build community, we need to lighten up, OK? <laughs> Second lesson I learned about getting people engaged is the importance of starting where people are. Uh, a key part of that is uh, starting where they're at physically. So you may get more people. I mean, this is an amazing turnout. You may get more people out in Chilliwack than you would in your particular neighborhood, right? You may get more people out in your neighborhood than you would on your street for an event. But you're never going to get as high a percentage of participation if you involve people right on the street where they live, right? Because if it's Chilliwack wide, people are going to say, hey, I don't need to show up because I know somebody else will, right? If it's on your street, who's going to take care of it if I don't take care of it? And if I don't get involved, my neighbor's going to know I'm not involved. They're going to be in trouble. And child care is easier. Transportation is easier. And you see the immediate benefits from your participation. So really, the closer you involve people to where they live, the more likely they are to get engaged. Uh, that's why Block Watch, you have Block Watch here, right? Neighborhood Watch, Block Watch, uh, is so effective. You know, you tend to get everybody on the block. But, but it's sort of a backwards program. It's sort of like people get organized when it's too late, right? There's been a crime wave. Then people come together. It's a, it'd be a whole lot better if people could organize before the crime. Then you wouldn't have crime, right? So I always say the safest blocks are the ones that don't focus on safety. They just focus on what's important to the neighbors. They build those relationships. You build the relationships and get to know each other, look out for each other, you're going to be a lot safer. So here's all the things you could do at a block level. This is in Lawrence, Massachusetts, where people wanted to, uh, uh, the, the, the city wanted to get every block organized. So they said, if you will uh, convene your neighbors and facilitate a discussion over dinner, we'll pay for all the ingredients. And so one block at a time, they've organized every block in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And they have three dinners in each block. And over that time, they just talk about, what do we like about our neighborhood? What would we like to see improved? What do we have to contribute? And they come up with ideas of projects they could work on together. So here's some things you could do. Uh, this is in uh, the UK. They closed down all the streets in the country for one night, one, after, one, uh, one noon, and everybody eats lunch together. Millions of people eating lunch together, but everybody eating on their own block. It's a really cool idea. This is a, a, a neighbor a block in Seattle that had a vacant lot that was a problem. They turned it into a community garden. Do you, do you have little free libraries here? Yeah. You all know that movement? Yes. Yeah, yeah started in a small town in Wisconsin. There was a guy whose mother was a librarian. She had died. He was trying to figure out how to memorialize her, so he built a little free library in his front yard. Told neighbors, come over anytime you want and, and borrow a book, but leave your own. Now I see these popping up everywhere I go, everywhere I go. My daughter just installed one last week. So uh, it's a great way to uh, get neighbors connected, particularly places. You know, I always talk about the importance of bumping places. The community is all about bumping into each other. It's about relationships. So it's, it, and, 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 and so you need places to bump, right? You need those gathering places. And the closer the bumping places are to where you live, the more likely you are to bump into the same people over and over again. That's why it's so hard to build community like in a bedroom community that's designed for cars instead of for people, because there's no bumping except for cars, right? <laughs> So uh, little free libraries can be a great strategy, no matter where you live, to help create more bumping, more interaction among residents. This is, uh, they have one shelf for adult books, one shelf for kids' books. I love it. They're always coming up with new designs. And it really gets people to interact. Uh, this is in the Selwood neighborhood in Portland. They were trying to figure out how to slow down traffic and how to really uh, take pride in their block. So they painted a mural in the middle of the intersection. They didn't ask any permission from the local government because they knew they'd never get it. They just did it. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, <laughs> but it's been so successful that now the local government permits it. It's taken all the fun out of it. Now you've got to do application forms. and you know, but, but it's popular. It's taken off all over. We've got them all over Seattle now as well. But um, 
they, they figured out how to create all kinds of bumping places here, right at the intersection, where there were no parks, there were no other bumping places. So they just used the intersection. They created a cob bench. They created a place where they have a tea station. And some, one of the neighbors takes responsibility every day for filling up the teapot with hot water. And they always have tea bags there. It's just a way for neighbors to come together and connect with each other. They have a little information station, another corner, vending machine, and a kid's playhouse, all at one intersection in a residential neighborhood. This is uh, Portland people are crazy, but this is, uh, <laughs> they, there's another neighborhood that had no gathering place. And it, so they, but they said, we have an old van. So they painted the van and artists created wings for the van. And they pull into the neighborhood and they extend the wings from the van. It looks really cool. They call it the T-horse. And inside the van, they have all these uh, card tables and chairs, so they set those up underneath the wing. And inside the van, they also have the capacity to make tea. So all the neighbors are invited to come out and sit under the wings and drink tea together. And they've been told the day before that tea horse is coming, so they've made Nanaimo bars and you know, uh, cookies and all that kind of brownies. And it's just a great way to get people starting to connect with each other. This is in a small village in uh, Taiwan where they had no bumping place, no, no uh, parks. So uh, everybody on the block put a, 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 a picnic table on their front, uh, build a little park in their front yard. And so neighbors come together and eat together. They play games together, drink together. Uh, it's, a, it's a great strategy. And I see this happening more and more where people are turning their front yards into community gardens, uh, putting a bench in the front yard, putting a picnic table. Uh, ways to create those bumping places in places that aren't design, designed to be so community friendly. Uh, this is a neighborhood leader who uh, uh, got everybody to put a little signboard outside their house to talk about what's special about your family. Uh, her family works in the mines, so they, she put a miner on her board. Uh, the neighbors are really into arts and, and uh, gardening, so they put that on theirs. Uh, this is in our Wedgwood neighborhood, a woman and her son with uh, development disabilities. And they got a red fire wagon, and they take it from house to house. And uh, at the house, they give people their choice of magazines to read. And then that person gives their leftover magazines. And it's a great way to keep that material circulating within the community. It's a great recycling strategy and a great way to connect the neighbors. So here's all the things you could do just on your block, on your street. Yes, it's a good uh, level at which you do crime prevention, but it's also the level at which you can prepare for emergencies. Do your emergency planning. That's where it should happen. Do block parties. Do skills exchanges. Share tools and pickup trucks. Buy in bulk. Uh, form a little co-op to uh, buy in bulk, uh, share tools, uh, uh, policy discussions, support for Alaska kids, support for housebound seniors, support for one another, ride share programs, create a community garden or pocket park on a vacant lot, install benches, picnic tables in your yard, improve, maintain common spaces like the alley, the median, the park traffic circle, etc. Maintain a mural, paint a mural in the intersection, plant street trees, provide a broad base for a neighborhood association, slow traffic with signs and art, create placards for the doorway. Way. Create a website for the block. Create a map. Oh, this is what we did in my neighborhood. We brought all the neighbors together and we said, what are the values by which we're going to care for the earth and we're going to support each other and support our children? And we had a long discussion about it. We wrote out the values and then everybody in the street signed it. It's a Mead Street Manifesto. Um, create a directory of available expertise. You know, somebody really knows the recycling system. Somebody else knows how to use technology. And how do we share that with each other on the block? Uh, conduct a talent show. Show outdoor movies on the side of your house. My daughter borrows my PowerPoint projector on weekends and shows movies on, her, on the patio of her uh, townhouse and invites all the neighbors over. <laughs> Celebrate Neighbor's Day. All kinds of stuff you could do. And the more you do, the safer you are. The more prepared you are for emergencies, the more you're caring for one another, supporting one another, the less you have to worry about your kids, because everybody's watching out for them. <coughs> Third uh, part of starting where people are is to start with their networks. Often we're trying to get everybody to join our group, and we forget that everybody's already organized. They just don't belong to our group. right? We often think we're the only show in town, whether we're the Rotary or the Neighborhood Association. But just about everybody's organized. And people only have so much time in their lives. They don't have time to join yet another group. So thinking about all the ways people are organized in your community, into faith-based groups, into school-based groups, into hobby groups, sporting groups, senior groups, youth groups, formal groups, informal groups. There are hundreds of groups in your community, hundreds of organizations. And oftentimes, the only groups that the council deals with are you know, the, the ratepayers' groups, right? <coughs> 
But it's like, how do we connect everybody? Right? Because we all, we're all, we're all, the only way we get the whole participation is we connect all those networks. So thinking about what are the other networks in your community? Who are you missing out on? Who could you invite in so you really have a much more uh, representative community? So you have a much bigger voice with City Hall and so you can do more in your community. I find that, that no one association represents everybody in the community. It's really hard to build inclusion in one group. Uh, you know, people who are different don't feel that welcome, even though we try to welcome them. Because the agenda has already been set, the leadership is set, the language is set, the relationships are set. So if you really want to get diversity and reach out to people who are underrepresented in your organization, it's great to figure out who's underrepresented in my group and what group are they a part of. And to meet with them and find common interests and figure out how you can start working together across the different networks. Just an example of that, how uh, many groups can, can work together to do great stuff. So this is in Wodonga, rural Victoria in Australia. There are a group of neighbors who wanted to build a community garden. And they approached the local church, so we tear up the grass to put in a community garden. The church said, sure. They're trying to figure out how to build the raised beds. They contacted a local association. The Men's Shed. <laughs> do you know the Men's Shed movement in Australia? No. It's phenomenal. Every town has a big shed full of power tools. <laughs> and retired men get together and make things out of wood. They make wooden toys. They renovate community facilities. They build little free libraries. It's really cool. And it's a great mental health strategy for the men because they're able to talk about issues with the blokes that they're uncomfortable talking about at home. And their wives love it because it gets them out of the house for a while, right? <laughs> it's a great program. So the men, here's, here's all the tools he's got in his men's shed. So they built the raised beds. But what I loved is everybody in the community got involved in this project. There was a role for everybody. They reached out to the Mutual Assistance Association for New Immigrants and Refugees. They were excited because they were able to grow food indigenous to their culture. So the Senior Center got involved. The crops grew. They realized there was a commercial kitchen in this church. They said, can we use your kitchen? They said, sure. The local chef came up with the most amazing recipes, and the whole community came together to gather that produce and to process it. So the women's group from the local church got involved. The high school student club got involved. Across the street is an institution for people with intellectual disabilities. They are no longer the people with disabilities. They are the community chefs. They are so proud to be cooking for the community. And they worked together and produced thousands and thousands of the most delicious, nutritious meals you can imagine for people who otherwise would have no food at all. That is the power of community. That is the power of working through all the networks. Fourth part of starting where people are is to start with their passions. Too often times we're leading with what we're passionate about, you know, or what we get paid to be passionate about, or what we got a grant to be passionate about. <laughs> and then when nobody joins us, we say, boy, people are apathetic, <laughs> right? Nobody's apathetic. Everybody cares deeply about something. So it's much better to start with a question than with an answer. What keeps you awake at night? What are your hopes for your family, for your community? If you can tap into what people care most deeply about, give them a sense they can do something about it, they're much more likely to get involved than to spend a lot of time trying to convince them to care about what you care about. Right. So I just want to share a story about uh, a community that figured out how to do that. That's in Darwin, England, uh, a community just a little bit smaller than this one. Uh, and they came up with a really clever strategy. They bought some cheap living room furniture from Ikea, just enough to fit in the back of a van. And they set it up in public places, and it just looks weird. They have a carpet, they have a coffee table, they have a vase with flowers, they have a stuffed cat. <laughs> and now they have a sofa, they call it the idea sofa. And so they'll set it up in front of the church on a Sunday morning. They'll set it up at the sporting field on Saturday afternoon. They'll take it to the mall on Friday night. And it just looks weird, so people are kind of drawn to it. <laughs> and when people come over, they're invited to sit down on the sofa and share their idea for what would make for a better Darwin. And it attracts people who would never, ever, ever come to the meetings. And everybody who has an idea is invited to come to the school on a Saturday afternoon for a workshop. And at the workshop, they develop their idea into a proposal. They do speed dating to share the ideas with each other. And at the end of the workshop, they pitch their idea, their proposal to the whole community. And everybody votes on which idea they're going to support with their time and up to 1,000 pounds. 
Through that process, 37 projects emerged in the first six months. These women came together and formed a soldier support group to clean up the local cemetery. The young people formed an environmental organization, a green cycle program. They worked together to clean up the local estate and plant daffodils everywhere. They worked with the kids to build a skate park. They organized a scarecrow festival, including the invisible scarecrow. <laughs> but 37 projects in six months, and most were led by people who had never been active in their community before. Because they followed that basic principle. Instead of always going out trying to recruit people around our idea, and always trying to get people to come to our meetings, go where the people are, and encourage them to follow their own passions. <coughs> and the uh, fifth part I learned about starting where people are is to start with their call. I learned this from a friend who's a duck hunter. <clears throat> My duck hunter friend taught me, he says, every duck will respond to a call. There's just a different call for every different type of duck, right? So there's one for the loons, there's one for the coots, there's one for the mergansers, there's one for the wood ducks, there's one for the mallards. Every duck has its own call. My friend says, too often times in our community outreach, we just sound the loon call. <laughs> and we wonder why only loons come to our meetings. <laughs> You get what you call. <laughs> he says, too often times the only call we use is the meeting call. I didn't say the meeting call. Meeting call would be kind of interesting, but the meeting call. And for a lot of people, that's the worst call in the world. They know they come to that first meeting, they're going to be the sign-in sheet and sentence to meetings for the rest of their life. <laughs> right? And a lot of people don't see results from meetings. One meeting just leads to another meeting, leads to another meeting. Nothing ever happens. Right? A lot of people are shy. They're told, look, if you really care about your community, you're going to come to our meetings. So they come, but they just sit. They don't feel like they're contributing. That's how much they care. They actually show up. So if we really want to get everybody engaged, we need to use all the calls. A person who's shy may feel comfortable one-on-one -on -one as a tutor, as a mentor, making a difference in somebody's life. So the volunteer call. I love the social call. We know people come out for food. They come out for music. We shouldn't apologize. The purpose is to build relationships. I love the project call. With projects, unlike with meetings, there's always a result. Role for everybody. In the process, people build the relationships. And once they build the relationships, then they're more likely to come to some meetings, because we need a few meetings as well. But we always lead with the meetings and wonder why the same people keep showing up. Right? If we can use all the calls in our community work, we're likely to get a much broader participation. Third lesson I learned is the importance of striving for results. When I was doing community organizing, I was walking around house to house trying to organize a neighborhood association. So I'd knock on the door and say, are there any problems in the neighborhood? Because you know it's easy to organize people around a crisis. Mm -hmm. And I'd knock, it's, it's kind of sick. Like if there wasn't a crisis, I was pretty depressed. It's <laughs> <laughs> the only way I knew how to bring people together. But I'd knock on the door and say, do you have any problems in the neighborhood? And they'd say, why? You can't fight City Hall. Or I knock on the door and say, do you have any problems in the neighborhood? They say, why, are you a lawyer? <laughs> it was a pretty sad statement about a democracy where people think that only lawyers and politicians have any power. So we tried to give people a sense by banding together through collective action they could make change. So we didn't start with world peace, because it's kind of hard to see results. We didn't start with climate change, kind of hard to see results. Doesn't mean we shouldn't work on those big issues, but people are never going to work on the big stuff if they don't think they even have power to make change on their own street. So really important to start with small winnable issues, small projects where people can see the benefits of working together. And once people have that sense of power, then they're more likely to work on the bigger things. They just aren't going to start there. And finally, don't sit on your assets. <laughs> yeah. And the point here is that absolutely everybody in our community Absolutely everybody, without exception, everybody has gifts to give to our community. Everybody does. And I like to think of them as three kinds of gifts. One are gifts of the head, that person's knowledge. Gifts of the heart, that person's passions. And gifts of the hands, that person's skills. Absolutely everybody has these. But the problem in our society is that we have labeled most people not by their gifts, but by what they're missing. We label people by their deficiencies. We use terms like homeless. When you think about a homeless person, you think about a lot of gifts. No, you think about what they're missing, a home. I got a friend who's a minister in Cincinnati, Ohio. Members of his church have a soup kitchen in the basement for homeless men. 
Finally, somebody got the idea and says, why don't we interview these men, find out what their gifts are? Turns out a whole bunch of these men like to cook. They said, would you like to help cook the meals in the soup kitchen? They were overjoyed. Nobody ever thought to ask them that before. And after a while, the homeless men and the members of the church are cooking and eating together. And it was kind of hard to tell who were the providers and who were the clients because it wasn't about services anymore. It was about community. To me, that's the definition of community, <laughs> recognizing we all have gifts and we all have needs. It's about supporting each other's needs with each other's gifts. Unemployed. Poor person. I got a friend in Ames, Iowa, started up a project. She, she recognizes everybody's got poverty in their lives. For some people, poverty is a lack of money. And for other people, poverty is a lack of meaning and relationships. And she often finds that the people with the most money have the least meaning and the fewest relationships. So she brings people together across class to help each other with their poverty. Really powerful to lift off those labels. Non-English speaking. We define new immigrants and refugees by the one language they don't know. I can't tell you how many refugee friends I have who know multiple languages, but we miss out on that gift if we just focus on what they're missing. Single parent. Who's got better time management skills than a single parent? <laughs> Addict, offender, at-risk youth. We never talk about young people in my country anymore without the adjective at-risk. And there's truth to every one of these labels, but they just describe part of the truth. Young people are at risk. We're all at risk. Some of us older people are even more at risk, right? You lift off that label. Who's got more energy than young people? Who's got more creativity than young people? Who's got more at stake in the future of our community than young people? Who understands technology better than young people? And who are the experts on young people more than young people? And yet we sit around and we talk about the youth problem. Our problem is we aren't engaging the gifts of young people in our community. Old person, I get increasingly sensitive to that one. <laughs> and disabled. We got more and more and more people falling under that label as we discover more and more and more disabilities. And again, there's some truth to that label, but it's only part of the truth. And we just focus on people's disabilities who miss out on all their abilities. How many people in this room have no disability? I see some eyeglasses. My disability is my memory. It gets worse every year. If I don't say I'm disabled, please hire me. I try to think of some gifts I have. And yet there's a huge growing section of our population that we define solely in terms of their disability and we miss out on all their gifts. So I just want to share one last story about the power of lifting off those labels. Because I tell you, if we just label people by what they don't have, they become clients in a service system. And we focus on people's gifts, they become citizens in our community. Because that's the basis of citizenship. Right? And I'm not denying that people have needs, people require some services. I think everybody in this room has some needs. Everybody in this room requires some services. But I think most people in this room would be identified primarily by your gifts. And I think most people outside this room be, be identified primarily by what they're missing. And then we wonder why all these individuals aren't active in our communities, because we have defined them out of community. We have defined them as clients rather than as citizens. So really powerful to lift off that label. So we did that in Seattle. We were concerned that our neighborhood associations tend not to look like the neighbors. They tend to be more homeowners than renters. They tend to be more middle-aged and few, fewer young people. Uh, and probably the people who were the most excluded were people with developmental disabilities. So we started up a program called Involving All Neighbors to focus on the gifts of people with disabilities, to connect them with community action. So I want to share a couple stories. This is Matt. Matt and his mom came to see me, and Matt says, I've been living in the Ravenna neighborhood now for nine years. I don't know anybody. I said, Matt, what do you love about your neighborhood? He said, I love Ravenna Creek. Oh, man, what did he do here? I love Ravenna Creek, and he took me to the creek. I knew the neighborhood was working hard to make it uh, better salmon habitat, so I talked to Thomas, who was head of the Neighborhood Association. I said, could you involve Matt in your project? He said, yeah, we can always use more volunteers. So they trained Matt how to remove the invasive plants and how to reforest with native plants. And it wasn't long before Matt became the expert. He was leading all the work parties. But Matt's greatest gift, he's got this incredibly infectious personality, so he comes and he knocks on your door and says, I am Matt. <laughs> I really care about the salmon, don't you? I do. You're going to help me, aren't you? Of course. You can't say no to Matt. 
He is the number one volunteer recruiter in the neighborhood. He's got armies of people clinging out that invasive holly. That's his gift. He builds community like nobody else. And at, um, at Christmas time, he organizes a, he's really creative, he organizes a holiday party. And everybody goes and collects the invasive holly from along the creek, makes Christmas decorations. Then he invites everybody back to his house afterwards for a big party. And he's totally socially uninhibited. He's always the first one out on the dance floor. He helps everybody else break out of their shells. That's his gift. This is Susan on the right-hand side. She's chair of the Delridge Neighborhood Association. She wanted to create a more inclusive association. So she worked with our Department of Social and Health Services and said, could you send letters out to all your clients? And the letter basically said, hi, I'm Susan. I'm chair of the Neighborhood Association. We'd love to get you involved. If you're interested, give me a call. So she got a call from Ginger and Raymond. She went to their house. They said, we've been living here 20 years, and we don't know any of our neighbors. She looked around the inside walls of that house, and there were all these crafts on the walls. She said, well, those are cool. What's with the crafts? They said, that's how we spend our time. We make crafts. And a lot of the crafts had clown themes in them. She said, what's with the clown? And Ginger said, well, Raymond used to be ready to the clown, but he hasn't clowned in 20 years. Susan said, we're having our Delridge Community Festival on Saturday. Could you come down and do some clowning for us? He was so excited. He and Ginger dug through his boxes, found his clown outfit. Saturday, Susan came and picked him up. He was the hit of the festival. Kids absolutely loved him. They started inviting him to kids' birthday parties, to other community events. And in the process, he and Ginger met other people who did craft work. And they started getting rides to craft shows. And they were able to make some income and make friends. Susan said that Raymond and Ginger opened doors for her in that neighborhood like nobody else had been able to. And finally, this is Larry. Larry, as you can see, has a disability that makes him totally dependent on public transit. So Larry knows the bus system better than anybody else in this Capitol Hill neighborhood. He knows all the places the bus goes. He knows all the places the bus should go but doesn't go. <laughs> he knows where there should be covered bus shelters, where there should be better security lighting. So when the neighborhood did their neighborhood plan, they tapped Larry to help with the transportation element. And Larry led a walking tour of the business district, pointing out all the access problems, because they weren't just a problem for Larry, they are a problem for elders with their walkers, parents with their strollers. Larry became so highly valued, he was elected vice chair of the Capitol Hill Community Council. Somebody with intellectual disabilities. Somebody who'd been seen as a person with nothing but needs is now a leader in his community because people thought to lift off those labels. So in the same way we've labeled individuals, we've labeled our neighborhoods. We tend to always focus on what we're missing in our neighborhoods. We're always focusing on the problems in our neighborhood. And as a result, we're always looking outside our neighborhood for all the solutions. And we've forgotten about this map of the same place, which are all the reasons we live in our neighborhood. All the strengths of the individuals, the different associations, the physical and natural environment, the local economy. There are all kinds of underutilized resources in our community that we could tap to make change. But it really requires everybody to get involved. It requires a new kind of leadership. Too often times, we just have one person doing all the work. You know, there's that martyr who says, boy, I'm, I'm just getting burned out. I'm working 24-7. Nobody will help me. But it's often because we aren't letting go. And nobody can do it as well as I can, right? And we need to start recognizing that leadership is all about, it needs to be shared leadership, that no one person has all the gifts we need to build community, but collectively, we've got everything we need. Do you all know the story of stone soup? It's like stone soup, right? The magic isn't in the stone, the magic is in community, right? It's when we all share our gifts that we're able to build community. So one person is the good facilitator, another person's a good spokesperson, another person makes a great pie that'll get people to come. Another person's a good welcomer. We need all those skills. And if we can break the leadership into smaller pieces, more people are going to be willing to step up. They just aren't going to take on that 24-7 job. The iron rule of organizing is never do for people what they can do for themselves. So oftentimes, in our efforts to help our neighbors, we're taking away their own capacity. And always thinking about, what are their gifts? How could they contribute? And love Lazo's quote, when the best leader's work is done, the people will say, we did it ourselves. <laughs> right? And finally, I share stories. You know, we often say that agencies, professionals are motivated by data. They like to keep numbers. Communities are motivated by stories. Stories inspire us. Stories get us thinking about what's possible. And too often times, those stories aren't in the papers. They aren't in the media. The media tends to focus on the abnormal. 
They focus on the problems. And then we start thinking that's the norm. So I think social media is a great way to start getting our own stories out. We start sharing those stories about the power of neighbors working together. It helps people realize their own power. It gives people ideas about what they might do in their own community. When I was in Edinburgh, they had a whole museum dedicated to the people stories. Because too often times our museums are about you know, the, the rich people, the politicians. The, uh, you know, and this is just a story about neighbors, about the labor movement, about cooperatives, about neighbors uh, making change in their communities. And they were really the ones who made Edinburgh the great place it is. When I was in Singapore, they had a stories on wheels, a van. And it goes from neighborhood to neighborhood. And you climb on the van and you share a videotape of your story of good neighbors. And then that van goes to the next neighborhood and they play your video and somebody else records their story. And now they have thousands of stories of good neighbors. It's really contagious. So I know there's tons of great stuff happening here in Chilliwack. We need to get those stories out and inspire people about what's possible and really build this movement because we have way too much at stake to just keep it to ourselves. I know you guys are all working hard on your own projects, on your own initiatives, but what I'd really encourage you to think about is how can you have more talks with other people, find out what they care about, connect with other networks. We really need to build this movement. I'm so encouraged by the number of people that are here today. And I know it's tough work. I know oftentimes we're working really hard and we wonder what difference am I making in my community? You know, here I am working hard to make a community garden or to, you know, to put in a little free library or to, uh, you did the piano thing, right? Yeah, get that piano in. You know, and, and oh, I love that piano. Uh, so, you know, you do these little things and say, oh, this is cool, but what difference am I making? You know, we have these huge global issues. And what encourages me, and the reason I share stories from around the world, is because you are part of a global movement. What you are doing here in Chilliwack is happening in every corner of the world. There are people like you everywhere who care passionately about their community, who care passionately about the earth, and are working so hard to make change. And I'm convinced that if we all keep at it, and if we build this movement, we're going to make serious change, and we need it. I got a friend who says, you shouldn't waste a good crisis. <laughs> and we really can't afford to waste too many more. So I want to thank you for what you do here in Chilliwack. It really is, gives me hope. It gives me a lot of hope. I just, I'm the luckiest guy in the world because I just meet great people everywhere I go. And it just keeps me very optimistic, very hopeful. So thanks for inspiring me. Uh, I hope I've given you some ideas. Uh, this is my uh, website. Uh, on my website, I've got some uh, lots of resources, lots of uh, different links. I've got uh, my email. I've got my phone number. Love to stay in touch. If you have a story you want to share, if you're looking for resources, if you have questions, if you want to continue the dialogue, would love to stay in touch. I'm, I love coming to Chilliwack, but what I'm really serious about, what I'm really passionate about is community and change. So I want to see something happen out of this, okay? Really. I hope you had a good time tonight, but I want to see something happen. Okay? This is on, but you guys can probably hear me. Jim, thank you so much uh, for being here tonight and presenting. Um, I think we have some time. Um, I'm not sure if the mic is working or not, or if people just feel comfortable standing up and asking questions. But if, uh, if you're willing... Uh, oh, I'd love to. I'd love to have... Yeah. If people would like to uh, share a, a story, ask a question, Rebuttal, whatever you got. Yeah, yeah. Pitch an idea. Uh, Jim's here, and, and we'd love to hear from you as well. So. Yeah. Can you tell us about the matching funds and all that? Yeah, yeah. So what happened was, um, this is in the late 1980s, and, and as a, our neighborhood, we've always had active neighborhood groups in Seattle, totally independent of City Hall and independent of each other. And they were becoming increasingly active in the late 1980s, a lot in response to changing character of neighborhoods, the growth of Seattle, the crime problems. But one of the big issues was they said the city's always putting money into projects for developers downtown, for big projects, and never enough into our community priorities. And the city's excuse was, look, if we did that project in your community, we'd set a precedent. We'd have to do it for all the communities. We can't afford to do it for all the communities, so we're not going to do it for anybody. Okay? Does that sound familiar? I mean, and so, uh, so I said for projects like that, projects have been a priority for the community, but haven't been a priority for City Hall. How about if we meet the community halfway? How about if we provide a cash match from local government in exchange for the community's equal match of volunteer labor? 
valued initially at $10 an hour. And professional services valued at the going rate if they're needed for the project. And how, I said, how about if we make this available to any group of neighbors? So this isn't for the not-for-profits, because we put lots of money in nonprofits for basic services. This is just neighbors who want to come together to do a project to get people engaged with each other. Um, uh, so it's, it, you don't have to be incorporated. You, you don't have to have nonprofit staff, just neighbors. And how about if we just fund one-time projects? Because the idea is to build capacity rather than create dependence. So we aren't going to fund staff, operating costs, rent, one-time projects. And how about if all the funding decisions are made by the neighborhood leaders themselves? So I took this idea to our city council. It was very controversial. You know? Why should we put any money into projects that aren't our priority and we don't have enough money for everything that is? It's a good question. Finally, at a vote of five to four, they approved $150,000 for that first year. With that money, we support 22 community self-help projects. They were so popular that the next year, our council voted unanimously to increase the fund to $1.5 million. And they've subsequently increased it to $4.5 million a year. So now we've completed uh, over 5,000 projects over the past 25 years. There's evidence of those in every neighborhood of Seattle, greatly reinforcing what's special about that place, contributing to the quality of life. The city's $60 million investment over the years has leveraged $85 million in community resources that under the old model where people were looking to City Hall to do everything never would have been tapped. But the best benefit is it's newly involved tens of thousands of people in community life because we've finally given people a way to get involved other than going to meetings. So it's, it's been incredibly successful. And that program is being replicated all over the world now. And I hasten to add, you don't need $4.5 million. In fact, I think 4 and a half is way too much money. Because if it's too much money, all the nonprofits are trying to figure out how to get their head under the tent, right? And, uh, and really, most of the resources are in your neighborhood. There's incredible untapped resources in our neighborhoods. So uh, the city of uh, Maple Ridge has a matching fund program that started uh, just last year. And I think their fund might be $10,000. <coughs> and they funded eight projects last year, which is more than we did the first year proportion to uh, population. Uh, Victoria's had a, a matching fund program going for 25 years. Vancouver's had one for 20 years. Uh, they're, they're all over the world. Uh, but it's you know, something, um, I just mentioned it for the first time to the city. So, but, and they were pretty intrigued with the idea as well. So it might have some possibilities. But you know, frankly, most of those projects could have happened without city dollars. It's, uh, the resources, there's incredible resources in, in, your, in your community. Other questions? Yeah? What do you feel about liability? <laughs> Good. <clears throat> that always, that's usually the first question that comes up, right? <laughs> Everywhere I go, no matter where I'm at. Um, so uh, let me tell you a little story. We started up the matching fund. Uh, I knew there'd be a lot of interest in parks, because I figured parks would uh, lend themselves well to volunteer labor, right? And, um, and people kind of identify with their parks. So I went and met with our parks superintendent. I said, great news. We're going to have a matching fund. We're going to have all kinds of volunteers building new parks, new playgrounds. It's going to be so fantastic. Oh, no. We don't want people messing with our parks, she said. And I sort of bit my tongue thinking, whose parks are they? But I listened to her, and she had very legitimate concerns. She said, Jim, you're tell you're, you're, um, uh, um, <coughs> uh, what you're proposing just can't be done. You're talking about getting money out to neighbors who aren't incorporated. We can't legally do that. Uh, she said, what about liability? What about health and safety? What about who's going to maintain these? What about union agreements? And that's the stuff that comes up everywhere. I tell you, every city I go to, there's neighbors that want to do projects, and they get to City Hall, and they're told all the reasons why it can't happen. And they're all legitimate reasons, but it's so much easier to say no than to say yes. So we figured out how to say yes, and that was really more valuable than the money. So what we said was, we're going to team up neighbors with a nonprofit organization that has the capacity to handle the money. So they'll act as a fiscal agent. And we give them a little bit of money for their trouble. So it's a great arrangement where the neighbors can focus on the project and the nonprofit focuses on the paperwork. And it builds a relationship between the two. Uh, the nonprofit often has liability insurance, so the group's covered during the construction of the project. If they don't, we use some of our matching fund to cover liability insurance. We also pay for volunteer insurance. It's, it's cheap. It's $1 per volunteer. Um, we, uh, we are self-insured as a city once a project's built, so we just want to make sure it's built to the standards of the department. So we require pre-application for large projects so the department can review it against their safety standards and review the budget, give a technical review, and, and give it back to the applicants. So when they file their final application, 
Hopefully it can be supported by the department because we're not going to give any application to a citizen review group until it's been signed off by the department. And over time, departments have really loosened up on their standards. They've learned to really trust the community on these projects because there's a lot of expertise in our communities. Um, maintenance. Um, we work out a maintenance agreement before we sign the contract. And usually it's a fight over who gets to maintain it because the community's put so much work into it, they want to maintain it themselves. And they can often maintain it at a higher standard than our city has resources to maintain it. Um, the general rule is if it's a new project, this, uh, you know, like a new pocket park, a new community garden, the community <coughs> takes care of it. If it's an existing project that's being refurbished, that has been the city's responsibility in the past, it's usually the city's responsibility to take care of it. But we, we're clear about that before we sign the contract. So we figured, that was the big, best value of the matching fund, taking down the red tape. And then we figured out the system and people can just come in the door and do projects. We don't have to figure it out, reinvent the wheel each time. But they figured it out in all these other cities, so, you know. And, and really, people were very open to thinking about how can, we, how can we better partner with communities when we had the discussion today. So I think people are really up for it. They're, they're not easy issues, so it can't happen overnight, but I think people are up for a discussion about it. Right? Yeah. Ben. Yeah. <laughs> so on that uh, on that topic, Jim, what's your uh, suggestion to like to keep the, the conversation going here? Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Oh boy. Um, there's lots of ways it could go. I mean, somebody might want to volunteer to just say, hey, I'll, I w I'd like to create a network of people who are interested in pursuing how we could support each other to move in this direction, and because uh, I think it's really important as you're moving this way to you really have it driven by the community. So you're, you're, the community and government are working in partnership right from the start about how do we work better together. Um, so that could, that could be one idea. Um, another idea could be people might just have ideas now, things you'd like to see happen. You could raise your hand and other people could say, hey, I'd like to join and connect with you. And uh, you know, somebody might say, hey, I, I, I'm interested in starting up a community garden or I'm interested in a mural project or I'm interested in doing little free libraries or I'm interested in starting up a time bank. Uh, I did, you know, and, and see who joins you, uh, so we can get some actions happening out here. But I appreciate the question. I thought about keeping you here in Chilwa for uh, you know, a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> if I, then, then everybody expect me to do it all. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be pretty tempting. It's a great place, although I guess it gets a little colder. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no. Right. Right. I, any other suggestions about follow-up? I think it's a great, and I, I appreciate you asking. He asked the same question in council today. He said, I want to make sure something happens out of this in the city. So I don't want to just have this conversation and then everybody goes home. I just wanted to re-mention that we are having a TEDx Chilla in our community, and it's a great way oh, cool. to share stories from Tara and build our community. That's fantastic. Great. When, when's that happening? Uh, February 27th. Great. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, I was in Maple Ridge on, uh, on, two, on Monday, and they took me on a tour of projects, and other neighborhood activists went on this tour, and they were so, their eyes were just big, because they, they were totally unaware of all these projects in the different neighborhoods. There's a lot going on. So I think the first step is just kind of sharing some of that information about what's already happening, share some of those stories. Uh, this, the, they were so energized just by each other. They're all local speakers. Cool. That's great. That's great. That's great. And Jim, I forgot to mention uh, before, but you know, the, the, we were having a discussion uh, today at the city about uh, some of the, the cool stuff that's already happening, and uh, and you know, the little free library that happened a couple of weeks ago that we just opened. And I think it's the first one in Chilliwack. Uh, last last weekend, 300 people got together and did a river cleanup. You know, so there's, That's great. there's a ton of things That's great. Really, that I'm really proud about, that the council's really proud about. They're happy in the city already. But yeah. I think it's about uh, sharing that too, right? So yeah, no, I've heard a lot about you know people maintaining trails. So just the trail was on today. There was a sign saying volunteers had pined over a thousand trees there in that in that wetland. I know there's a lot of great stuff going on. So it's, it's like, how do we get more of that? And how do we share those stories about what's already happening? People might be a little shy in this room. And, and I think a, you know, there's a lot of information that you've yeah. given. Yeah. There's a lot of thoughts in people's heads you know, to move forward. And, and I'm sure there's going to be ideas flowing out of this. And, and, and you know, I personally thank you. I got charged up from your, 
you know, you're going to talk this, this afternoon and, and tonight, I'm sure everybody else did as well. So let's all take away and, and you know, we are all a team. We're all, you know, tr you know striving to make sure, like, you know, the, the best it could be. And whatever your group can do or wants to do or we'll try to facilitate, we'll, we'll try to help you, you know, like at our level. And, and, and let's all work together. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. We, we hadn't scheduled seven to nine, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got a little more time if people are up for it. Yeah, I mean, one idea would be just to have a quick discussion around your table about what you took away from this, uh, to talk about what are some things that are currently going on in your community that you're aware of, some cool projects, and maybe some next steps. And then maybe we just get that fed back. I'd really like something to happen out of here. So if we could just, could we just do that? Like five minutes around your table, just have a quick discussion about what you take out of this and what do you, what do you see as uh, potential here in Chilliwack? Because you know your community a lot better than I do, okay?